Now the next speaker is a friend of mine. I have literally walked the journey with him. This is a man who understands what crisis is all about. Believe you me, for 17 years, he was a male nurse. A male nurse. We honor him for that. Of course, he had a crisis of identity. That's what we would have said, prejudging him. But during that time, he was able to overcome some difficult challenges. From being a nurse, this man became the first minister of finance for the Northwest government. Wait a minute. From a nurse, not only for one, for two terms as a minister of finance, those days they did not have PPE problems. He, he, he didn't have any scandals. Everything was just sharp, sharp. He got promoted. He became the CEO, chief encouraging officer, catalyst empowering others for the South African Bureau of Standards. Some of you will recall there was a crisis. People were being shot at. And again, it's as if he attracts crisis. People are being shot at in the workplace. He becomes the CEO. I was privileged. He called ICANN to come on in to transform that organization. And his track record is amazing. From there, he became the first black president of the African Handel Institute. And then as if that was not enough, he was the chairman of the board of trustees for the seventh largest pension fund in the world. 870 billion rand at that time, he was the first chairman. Up to now, no PPE scandal, nothing stolen, everything, he left it intact. Actually, it's now one point something trillion. Today, he is the chairman of Exusio, which means authority. He's a director of Netcare and many other organizations. So we wanted a seasoned, Makhoto seasoned, not a, a mature or older, a seasoned veteran to come and talk to us about the credibility that we need as leaders. And particularly after this wonderful panel on how we are prepared to pass the baton. Because the problem, Mr. Martin Kaskas, in Africa, we die with this baton. Nintolela nizangshiala. We die with that baton. And instead of giving the next generation, what do we do sometimes? We throw it. And the poor millennials must be able to try and find this thing. Those days must begin to end. Hashtag, that kind of leadership must fall. Hashtag. Mr. Martin Kaskas, come up front, my bro, and come and inspire us and tell us on how do we get this thing right as elders so that we can pass the, uh, the baton to the next generation. Let's give my brother a wonderful round of applause. Are you gonna use this? Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, warm introduction, uh, Brother David. It's great to see you again and some of the old faces of the ICANN family that I haven't seen for quite a while now. Uh, this is also a historical day. It's my first day in Joburg, you know, since March. <laughs> I stay in Arabiaspoort and, uh, you know, interprovincial travel prevented me from coming to my car never saw petrol since March. I, uh, it's still on quarter tank. <laughs> and it went to the car wash last week, Saturday, because I didn't want to come with a dirty car to Joburg. But on a more serious note, I've um, been uh, asked to share with you this, morning, uh, this afternoon on um, how to lead effectively um, during this digital age. Let me start off by saying, you know, we've come a long way since the days when our forebears, their major economic activities revolved around hunting, subsistence farming, and the like. And the world has moved on, and uh, some people coined it revolutions. We went through four of them. The first was 
uh, the revolution that brought in, that was driven by mechanization, where machines took over the horse cart business. The second one, revolution was mass production, where people started producing things in mass. The factory lines and the big logistics came out of that era. The third revolution was computers. That's the age where we spoke about the information age. And now the fourth industrial revolution is driven by cyber physical systems where artificial intelligence, robotics, and the internet of things, that has become the order of the day. Now I've been asked by the organizers to uh, speak about, you know, the, uh, the DNA of effective leadership in the digital age but I took the liberty to slightly tweak the, the, th the theme without distracting from the substance. And I want to speak to you this morning. Do we have the slides on, Arnold? I want to speak to you this morning on the theme, Who Raises the Village? There's an old African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. And I want to ask the question, if it takes a village to raise a child, who raises the village? Who are the people that drives the thinking? Who are the people that drives the behavior and the attitudes and the values? As, uh, as Waylin has mentioned earlier on in, the, in, in a beautiful panel discussion, who are these people that drive these things in the village? You see, the world is increasingly being called a global village with globalization, with, uh, you know, the whole interconnectivity that we can't currently experience. The question remains, who raises the village? Who are those amongst us whose good judgment, born out of hard-earned experience, can be trusted as we grapple with serious development mental challenges moving forward? The last time I checked my dictionary, a revolution speaks of dramatic and wide-ranging change in the conditions, attitudes, and operations in our environment. And we are on the cusp of a major revolution. If we are not properly prepared for it, our village will go to waste. And as we navigate this new and relatively uncharted waters, of the fourth industrial revolution, with all the groundbreaking possibilities, our village need to be on our guard. Because otherwise, we will be the consumers, as is currently the state, and we will not be the ones that set the agenda that will move the processes in this world forward. Now, what's been happening in this village? Firstly, this village is quite urban. You know, uh, when I look at the last uh, economic forum report of 2019, since 1950 to 2019, the world's urban population has risen almost sixfold from 751 million to 4.2 billion people. There's close to 5 million people moving into cities per week which means it's a highly urbanized environment. Secondly, this village is relatively young. 42% of the world's population is now people under the age of 25 years old. But this village is also poverty stricken and uneven distribution of resource if, uh, socioeconomic opportunities. Half of the world's population is living on less than $5.5 per day, according to the latest Oxfam reports. And only 1% of the world's population owns about double the wealth, collective wealth of 6.9 billion of us, only 1%. So it's a scary thought what's happening currently in this village. But in this village, we also have a serious crisis of relationships. And this crisis is characterized firstly by increasing individualism, 
You know, nowadays when people get onto the scene, the first question they ask, what is in it for me? The collective good has been put on the back burner. Secondly, there's decreasing sociability in our village. We are so widely connected, and I, I don't want to knock, you know, technology. I'm doing fairly well with, with these things, and what could we have done with this conference if it wasn't there? But I was shocked the other day. I was watching, uh, I was shocked uh, a couple of months ago. I was watching a couple in, right in the, uh, with, their, with their family. They are there for lunch, but everybody's on their cell phone. We are so technologically connected and yet so racial, uh, uh, relationally disconnected. Thirdly, this village is also, uh, 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 this crisis of relationship is also characterized by increased materialism. Value judgment is based on externalities. When you see me, you want to find out, you look at what car I'm driving, what clothes I'm wearing, what position I'm, I'm occupying, and you know, these are the things that define me. And we don't look at the innate virtues and innate values of people. And charisma has superseded character. And we'll talk about that later on. And this village is crying out for leadership, credible leadership, a type of leadership culture that is more humane, authentic, and can give meaning to people's lives. On a daily basis, when me and you open up the media, there are just too many instances of betrayed trust, abundant values, exploitation, manipulation, and these things are done by very powerful people in our leadership ranks. I don't need to remind you, you know, the Zondos and all these type of things, some horrific stuff that comes out of them. And we will never be able to assert ourselves in this arena of the fourth industrial revolution with this type of leadership. We've got to change gears. And we've heard from the millennials this morning, our young people, yes, they are in charge of their own destiny but they need the support, guidance, and affirmation of us in the village to make their dreams come to reality. And this morning, let me submit to you, this afternoon, let me submit to you that credibility is the DNA of effective leadership. What do I mean with credibility? Credibility refers to the truthfulness of origins, Commitments and intentions. It enables you to deal with the external world, not based on external agendas, but in a conviction. Because, you know, there are people that can be tossed around. Just, it, 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 they shift allegiances just because of what they can get out of it. But credibility is also not a matter of outward technique. You know, credibility, you can't fake it. It's a question of having it, and of, of developing it, and having it. And credibility, you know, speaks of those type of leaders that can be trusted, they can be respected, they are admired, and they are, uh, they, they, uh, they are be we believe when these leaders start speaking to us. Now, how do we develop credibility? The list is not exhaustive, but I just want to leave you with six issues here this morning. Let me quickly run through it. The first area of development comes in the area of character development. You see, reputation is basically what other people think of me and you, the impressions that they have about us. But character answers this critical question, who are you really like when no one is looking? And therefore, we need to make sure that at the end of the day, we live our life informed by a value compass against all which all our decisions are evaluated. Now, I don't make an apology for that. I follow the Christian faith, and I've used the Bible primarily 
as one of my major sources that helps me as a compass to calibrate all of my decisions. Because if you don't stand for anything, you will fall for everything. And therefore, there must come a day in your life where you need to start defining for yourself what are the non-negotiables in my life. By so doing, you will develop your character. The second thing that helps us to develop credibility is that me and you must have clarity of direction. The two most important days in a person's life is the day when you were born, and the second most important day is when, the day when you actually discover why you were born. And some of us, the bulk of us, most probably have never put in serious thought to discover why they were born. And each one of us must at some stage of our lives start asking critical questions, what is my vision? What is my purpose and my reason for being? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Do I have a game plan to get me from where my current reality to the desired place where I should be? Am I aware of the things that I need to forgo, the sacrifices that I've got to make in order to reach that reality? And for those of us who are in the business and professional lives, it has never been about the money. It's about serving a higher purpose. If it's just about the money, you're going to be very, very much disappointed because I know very rich, poor people in this world. People with stacks of money, but there's no purpose for that money. They're not fulfilling a higher purpose. The third thing that we need to do to develop credibility is to develop our competence. And with competence, I mean having the requisite, the requisite skill set to get the job done. There's nothing that can undermine your credibility than being in aptitude and incompetent. I've worked under such leaders in my lifetime, and they're very quick to remind you they're the boss, and listen, yeah, it's my way or the highway, and those sort of things. And therefore, you know, they, they, they hide their, their incompetence sometimes through arrogance and threats and all those sort of things. You need to be known for something in which you can excel and become an expert and authority in the field. Martin has come to the realization that he can't be everything to everybody. So I spend a lot of time to excel in the following three things. Martin excels in people development. Martin excels in leading institutions, especially financial institutions. And perhaps if you've been listening attentively, for the last 10 minutes, you might also have discovered that Martin excels in speaking. <laughs> and therefore, we need to invest in the tools of our trade and hone our skills on a consistent basis because we're living in a world of specialization. And this will enable us to operate at the level of excellence. The fourth thing that will help us to develop our credibility is communication. You see, credible leaders have this ability to cut through the clutter and get to the core issue that needs to be dealt with. And once they understand what is the core issue, they then has to have this ability. They demonstrate this ability to articulate their intentions with such precision and power in a compelling, persuasive, yet graceful manner. It's not always what we say, it's how we say it. And some, some of us can be so rightfully wrong because the, of the way we say it. And therefore we need to communicate uh, at all times, we need to engage with care, concern, and sensitivity. You see, meaningful engagement is a matter of trust. John Maywood puts it so beautifully, he says, you cannot trust somebody that cannot be vulnerable, and you cannot be vulnerable to somebody that you cannot trust. And therefore, effective lead communication comes at a level where there's trust, because leadership is ultimately about taking people 
to be trusted enough to take people into areas that they never expect they're capable of going. And they can only follow you and they only can, can only go with you if they trust you. The fifth thing, how to develop your credibility, is that we need to develop composure. Ladies and gentlemen, behavior matters. I've been in the company of very influential leaders, and I tell you what you see on stage and what you see ultimately in private corners, it's scary the way they treat their staff, the way they speak to people, and so am I talking to the right audience here? You know such people? They don't have any emotional intelligence at all. And what do I mean? Because credible people have very strong levels of emotional intelligence. That ability where you can set a high degree of emotional intelligence is where there's a consistent display of emotional health and maturity that sets a positive mood. So to develop credibility, we've got to maintain impeccable character. We've got to make sure that we have absolute clarity of direction. We've got to work at our core competencies. We've got to communicate well. We may need to maintain a healthy composure. And lastly, we also need to make sure that we develop courage. I've been in this game too long to appreciate that you're going to lose certain fights. If I take off my jacket, you'll see a lot of scars on my back here. I've, I've been through a lot of instances where, you know, things didn't go as planned. It's a question of how do you get up, dust yourself up, and where you have this, the strength to persevere in difficult circumstances. It's actually a way of life. It's standing up for what you believe in, resisting compromise, and staying true to yourself no matter the cost. Because... Let me remind you this morning that a temporary setback in life is not fateful, uh, fatal. It's part of the learning process. It's out of those mistakes that we've made that we become more mature, that given a similar set of circumstances, what will we do differently? Now, let me get practical and allow with me to just share a small snippet of my leadership journey and how I had to develop credibility and what credibility has ultimately done for me to where I am today. As Dr. Malapo indicated earlier on, I um, started off 17 years ago uh, in the nursing profession. I, I was, <laughs> I was uh, in the nursing profession for 17 years. And then came 1994, I was approached by the ruling party to avail myself of politics. And I never actually liked this political game. It just sounded so sleazy and, you know. But well, those days, Madiba is in charge of the country. We didn't ch there was no back chat. We went and we wanted to change the country. I found myself in elected into the Northwest Provincial Legislature. And in a matter of a few days, my, my life turned around. Sworn in the Saturday, next week Thursday, Premier now sees Cabinet, and my name is uh, read out there as number seven, you're going to be the MEC of Finance. Now, I didn't understand a debit from a credit by then. Okay? <laughs> I'm just a nurse, you know. And now, when I, look, uh, when I went to sit in that chair, I discovered I'm now in charge of 5.8 billion rand. And my last training in finance was my civil servant salary. After deductions, when everything, the bond, everything is paid off, there was only six and a half thousand in the paycheck, you know. But through God's grace, I, meant to, I completed two terms there. And you can check with your friend Google. There's no skeleton in the closet. I didn't give any tenders to my family, jobs to my pals, and I had to develop credibility there. It was tough. But when your name appears at the golf club as an honorary member, you know your time is up. <laughs> and when you go to Leopard Park Golf Club now, you'll see my name there, Cindy, honorary member Martin Cuscus with my 18 handicap. 
because you can't play golf Wednesday and Saturday. It became too comfortable. So I moved into the SABS, where, as Dr. Malapu indicated, got into a total new field there. I arrived there and, you know, uh, I had to turn the place around to such an extent that uh, I was ultimately elected onto the ISO, General Cou onto the ISO International Council. I used to go to Geneva at least four or five times a year. But during that time, I was also approached by the Minister of Finance to become the first chairman of the Government Employee Pension Fund. And then I was, you remember when I left the Northwest, my last budget was about 22 billion rand. All of a sudden, I must now look after, at that time it was 850 billion rand. And you know, it was such an awesome responsibility because you're looking at the life savings of over one and a half million people. And on the 27th of April, and significantly so, I got an invite to the New York Stock Exchange by the late Kofi Annan, where he launched the United Nations Principles on Responsible Investment, and he only invited 36 founding signatories. And I wasn't invited because I'm African. I was invited because we were the seventh biggest pension fund in the world by then. And we signed up into the principles of responsible investment. And I spearheaded that process here in South Africa. It's about ESG, environmental, all our investments need to consider environmental integrity, social equity, as well as good governance. I served there for three years into that board. I was appointed onto that board of the Global Compact of the United Nations. And at some stage, I got an invite to actually go and address the United Nations. You can go and check, my friend. I was there on the 9th of June, 2008. I flew for 18 hours. I only spoke for 12 minutes, but I was there. <laughs> was there? Was there? Was there? Was there? And if you still doubt where I've got dress sense, during lunchtime, there was the, these 10 round, uh, uh, about six round tables. And we was heard, you know, ushered into a room there. And guess who walks in there? The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. And we were wearing exactly the same. Tamsanga, <laughs> Daniel, powder blue ties. Don't look at me, I'm getting old now. I've lost a bit, a bit of my touch. But he said, I believe you're from South Africa. And that's how we took that photo. And I tell you, I came back and we spearheaded this drive in South Africa on responsible investment. Why am I telling you this story? If I messed up in Mabatu, Cindy, and didn't maintain credibility there, and fiddled around with monies there of government, I would have never been appointed by President Becky to look after 850 million rand. Billion rand. I would have never been appointed. If I didn't look properly under, for that eight, after that 850 billion rand, the Mine Workers Provident Fund wouldn't have invited me to take them out of momentum and go and start our own self-administration platform of 148,000 members. I spent nine years there now, and I left there with eight clean, successive audits. They recruited me across the road there at Liberty now, and I'm on the Liberty Corporate Umbrella Funds because I had to build credibility. Do you get the picture? This is not, this is not political correctness. This is not being connected. This is a developmental process where you need to take a conscious decision about character. And I had to also develop my competence. I couldn't blame apartheid indefinitely. I had to learn the, the tools of the trade. I had to sp spend weeks at Harvard University, London School of Economics, and so on, and start understanding the language of money. I also had to make sure that, you know, I, 
I conduct myself well the way I communicate, the composure and all those sort of things, and I never allow these things to run to my head. Because there is honor in humility. I want to close by stating the following. The question still remains, who raises the village? You see, if we want to leapfrog into this new environment of smart cities and the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and so on, we will, it will warrant our collective ingenuity and we will need credible leaders to take us there. And given the vexing socioeconomic challenges that we're facing in our country, we'll call upon me and you to develop the type of credibility where we are believed, that we are trusted, that we are respected, and people admire us for who we are. See, I'm specifically talking today to our African leaders. We're on the back end of the developmental curve, yet Africa has been identified in the World Economic Forum as the new frontier of growth. And for us to leapfrog into that environment will warrant credible leadership. It warrant, will warrant people that has character, people that has absolute clarity of direction, people that can lead us into a spe specific situation. The way they communicate to us, we will be able to stand be, uh, be behind them and move forward in this environment. And yes, we owe it not only to ourselves, if we, as we've heard the cry of our young people this morning, we owe it to the next generation as well. They shouldn't find the place worse off than when we arrived here. When we depart from the scene, we should hand over a level of, 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 of envir uh, the, the environment must be such that what defines us as a people is not based on some of these things that are bringing us down nowadays, greed, selfishness, self-interest, and those type of things. We need to go back to who we are as a people, where the collective good makes sense. And yes, it's not just going to happen. It's about intentionality. You've got to take a decision about it. If you want to be credible, because credible leaders ultimately become incredible leaders. Long after they've left, their legacy still lives on. And therefore, as I close this, af this afternoon, learn it, lead it, live it, and lead it. I thank you.